Hi there, this is Craig Beck from StopDrinkingExpert.com. Welcome into today's episode. Uh, it's entitled, How Long Does Alcohol Withdrawal Last? Uh, because I seem to be getting a lot of emails at the moment asking that question. Uh, how long can I expect these terrible side effects of quitting drinking to go on for? Uh, it's quite a complicated subject, really, and it needs a whole heap of disclaimers, I'm afraid, because as you know, and as I make repeatedly this statement, I'm not a doctor. And I'm not here to give you medical advice. And this YouTube channel, my podcast, is not a replacement for your doctor. Uh, all I am is a former problem drinker who found a way out of the loop. And now I show people how to do it. So the first thing you need to be aware of is I don't help alcoholics. That's not my job. It's not what I do. And I'm not qualified to do it because alcoholics are physically dependent on this drug, on this substance. And because their body has become so conditioned to having this drug constantly in their system, if they stop drinking it, they're going to have a severe physical response. And when you have that sort of response, you need round the clock medical supervision. Now, if you're wondering what the difference is between an alcoholic and a problem drinker is it's purely that problem drinkers are in a loop with their drinking, but they're using it more for psychological addiction reasons. Their body hasn't become physically dependent on the drug yet. That's coming if they carry on doing what they're doing. It's in the mail. But at this point, when they reach out for help, they're miserable and they're seeing real negative consequences of their drinking appearing in their life, but they're not yet physically dependent on the drug. Uh, and this actually causes a, almost like a, a false safety net for a lot of problem drinkers because problem drinkers who are routinely using alcohol whether they're using it daily or binging at the weekend, that sort of stuff, are able to point to things in their, their behavior that they believe proves they don't have a problem. So, for example, back when I was a drinker, I would say, well, I can't be an alcoholic because I don't want to drink first thing in the morning. I don't get up and go, where's the, where's the alcohol? I just get up and go to work. So that means I'm not an alcoholic. That means I don't have a problem. Equally, I used to say, well, you know, I can make it through the entire working day without drinking. I'm not nipping off to the toilets, you know, the bathroom every half an hour to swig vodka. I don't need to drink when I'm at work. It's just that when I get home from work, the first thing I do is open the first bottle of wine. And that was my loop. But I used to say to myself, but you know, because I could go two or three days if I wanted to without a drink, I could even go a few weeks if I really wanted to. So therefore, I can't possibly be an alcoholic. And a lot of people who come to my website they're kind of, you know, they're, they're still at that denial stage where they're reassuring themselves that they can't possibly have a drinking problem because of these sorts of things that they can point to. So I help problem drinkers, people who are using alcohol to cope with the pressure of life. You know, these people may be opening a bottle of wine when the kids have gone to bed every night. Maybe at the weekend, Friday night, they just start drinking, they drink all weekend, and then every Monday they've got a terrible hangover and it's just in this loop and they can't stop it. And they've tried to moderate their drinking, they've tried to stop drinking on their own and they've failed. But this is really important. In other areas of their life, they are entirely functional. They're holding down a job. They're probably in a relationship. They probably have children or even grandchildren. They're not getting DUIs all over the place. They're not getting thrown in the drunk tank. Junk, drunk tank. They are, for the most part, entirely functioning in society and within their family circle. A lot of the time, most of their friends and family won't even know that they have a problem. And so the reason I'm, I'm going to great lengths to kind of paint the picture of what an alcoholic is and what a problem drinker is, is because if you're a problem drinker, you really won't have to deal with most of the severe alcohol withdrawal symptoms that you've heard about, unless you have some other underlying health condition. And that's why it's important that you always get your GP's advice before you make any big lifestyle change like this. But 95% of the people who come to my website are not alcoholics, they're problem drinkers. And for the most part, withdrawal for these people will feel like mild anxiety. It will feel like a stressy sensation. It's that feeling that you vocalize as, oh, I could do with a drink. That is 
withdrawal. And for most problem drinkers who stop with my help, that's the limit of how they're going to feel. Now, you will have heard the story propagated over and over again that it's dangerous to stop drinking and you, it could be fatal. Don't just stop drinking, you could kill yourself. And for 5% of the people out there, that's true. There is, there is a risk of something very serious happening. But the story is propagated and spread and kept alive by the alcohol industry because they want problem drinkers to worry about this. They want them to hear the message that if they st even think about stopping drinking, they're going to drop down dead. They want that out there in the public. And you might think, well, why would an industry selling alcohol want horrific stories about their product out there? And the answer is because that story makes drinkers feel stressed and worried and scared. They feel like they can't even stop if they want to. And what do problem drinkers do when they feel stressed, worried and scared? They drink. Alcohol is their panacea. They use it to fix everything. So by the alcohol industry propagating and keeping this story alive and making a kind of disconnect, suggesting that it applies to everyone, it accelerates the use of their product. Because it's something like 85, 90 percent of the profits of alcohol producers comes from 20 percent of their customer base the people who routinely use it, not the people who have an odd glass of sherry at Christmas and that sort of stuff. It's their routine users that provide the profits. So they want to keep these people in the loop. They want to keep them stressed and anxious because they know they have a solution to stress and anxiety and it's called alcohol. Now, if you fit into the 5% bracket where you are a full-blown alcoholic, and what I mean by that is that you are now so dependent on alcohol being in your system that you can't even go more than a few hours without some withdrawal symptoms appearing. If you are in the 5%, you need round the clock medical supervision to stop drinking. And the reason is your body has had to adapt. You've been drinking poison for years, probably decades. And your body is very intelligent, and very smart and very adaptive. And it's done its best to keep you alive in spite of the fact you've been poisoning it on a routine basis. And so the, the reality of the world has changed from the point of view of your body. We no longer just breathe air and drink water. We also have to have alcohol to sustain life now. So if you're a full blown alcoholic and you stop drinking, it's the same as removing air. It's the same as removing water. You're removing something that your body now needs in order to stay alive and function. So that's why you need supervision. There are three phases of alcohol withdrawal. OK, and it's it's kind of, it's a little bit counterintuitive because you would think it would start at the worst and then slowly get better. Yeah, you think it would kind of taper out and slowly fade away. But it's actually the reverse. Generally, for full blown alcoholics, not problem drinkers, full blown alcoholics, nine, 10 hours after they had their last drink, they're going to enter phase one of alcohol withdrawal. Now, phase one is pretty mild, even for severe chronic alcoholics. It's pretty mild. It might be nausea. It might be foggy thinking. It might be a headache. It might be confusion, uh, sort of, a, you know, hot sweats, cold sweats, clamminess, just a, a general unease. OK, so phase one and that can last a few hours couple of hours, 24 hours, two days, something like that. Now, phase two of alcohol withdrawal steps it up a notch. Basically, you take all those symptoms and just 10x them. They're all going to get amplified. So instead of nausea, it might be, you know, vomiting. It might be retching and vomiting and that sort of thing. And the, this opens the door to many other problems, because if you're vomiting continuously and not being able to hold down fluids, then you start to get dehydrated. When you get dehydrated, your organs start to struggle. And so if you've been abusing alcohol for a very long time, you may have compromised organs in your body and compromised parts of your body. Uh, so if you already have a failing liver and you go into alcohol withdrawal and you get dehydrated, 
the dehydration almost accelerates the breakdown of the liver organ and induces failure. So this is why it starts to get quite serious. And then phase three of alcohol withdrawal, you're, you're entering, you know, the possibility of seizures, grand mal seizures and fits and things like that. And it's not so much, you know, coming off alcohol that causes the potential risk of death. It's the other stuff that happens as a, as a result of that. So you quit drinking and you may choke on your vomit in the night, that sort of thing. Or you may have a seizure. Perhaps you have epilepsy and the severity of your withdrawal symptoms are so severe that they trigger an epileptic fit and then you, you die because of the, the fitting from the epilepsy. So to say that, you know, stopping drinking killed you is a, it's a little bit of a leap too far. It's a little bit of a disconnect because it's not really. It's the withdrawal having a kind of domino effect onto other things in your life. And obviously that's very serious. But it, it really, you know, I really do need to restate this over and over again because for the vast majority of people who worry about their drinking, people like the, the, the man I was, this doesn't apply. It's not relevant. I was drinking two bottles of wine a day and a bottle of spirits over the weekend. And I did that for probably about 15 years. That was my routine. But, you know, with a bit of willpower, I could take a month off. I think I did three months once using willpower. I could take a couple of days off. I could say, oh, you know, I've been drinking a bit too heavily. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday off the alcohol this week. And that's kind of the mark of the problem drinker. Alcoholics can't do that. They haven't got that choice. Their body needs the alcohol to function. And so I just want to make it really clear that if you're in the 95%, don't lose too much sleep about this. Certainly don't prevent it, you know, help make it prevent you taking action to deal with this thing that's making you miserable. Get advice from your doctor, but take action. Get the appropriate level of help that you need to match your level of drinking. I hope that helps. Uh, listen, just before I go, I just want to tell you that um, thank you to everyone who came to Sydney, Australia, Quit Drinking Boot Camp. What an amazing experience that was. So many just outstanding people made an amazing transformation on that day, and I was very, very pleased to be there. Uh, London is next up. London, uh, it's going to be near Euston Station, near King's Cross Station. Uh, if you want to come, you've got literally two days before the early bird pricing ends on that one, okay? So London is next up on, I think it's 8th of June. Uh, then Chicago. It's probably going to be the last U.S. quit drinking boot camp of 2019. And then for the first time ever in September, Dublin. My first time in Ireland, uh, which is strange because I love, you know, I've got a great affinity with Dublin. Both my kids are half Irish. Uh, so... This year will be the first one in Dublin, September. Go to the website and check out the dates and secure your place, stopdrinkingexpert.com. While you're there, why don't you join me for a free online coaching session and I'll even give you a copy of my best-selling book, Alcohol Lied to Me, free of charge. Thank you for being with me today. See you in the next episode.